All right, Sharon, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. I'll call this meeting to order for the Bennington Select Board for Monday, April 14th, 2014. Um, first item on the agenda tonight, let's um, all rise and pledge allegiance to the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next item on the agenda tonight is the reorganization of the board. And first thing, I'd like to welcome Michael Keene to the Board of Selectors. Thank you. Welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I will entertain motions for board chair. Tom? It's uh, my distinct honor and pleasure to uh, nominate Greg Van Houten as board chair. And uh, I'm hoping that he, if he uh, is elected, will serve as well as our pri prior chair. I'll second that. Thank you. Is there any further nominations? Okay, then I will call a vote. All those in favor of Greg Van Houten as chair, please raise your hand. And that's unanimous. Um, I will now entertain a motion for vice chair. Greg. I'd like to um, nominate Sharon Brush for vice chair of the select board. Second. Thank you. Are there any other nominations for vice chair of the select board? Okay, seeing none, um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, and that's also unanimous. Congratulations, Greg. I will officially well. turn the meeting over to you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to thank my, my fellow chair mem uh, board members here. Uh, it's really quite an honor to be elected to the select board and to be elected by them as your chair. Uh, the first official act, I think, is to declare winter over. Everybody's Don't okay be too sure. <laughs> see glimpses of it, but this is a welcome change. Um, and seriously, it's a, it was a difficult winter, even for those of us who like winter. Uh, it was a difficult business winter for a lot of people. So, as you get out and about, if you can try and support those businesses out there that have are, are just waiting for the sun to shine, uh, for for us to go out and support them, uh, they'd all appreciate it. And keep everybody going. Uh, the next item is the uh, minutes from March 24th, 2014. Um, there was um, one item on that that I would like to point out. We had a note on there of an open motion with no vote. Um, I, I buzzed back to CAT TV and there was actually a vote uh, to recognize the volunteers for Snowshoe, uh, the Snowshoe Championship that was a unanimous uh, unanimously positive vote. So I just wanted to make that note. And uh, if anybody else has any other corrections. No. I'd move as uh, correct. I'll second that. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? That is unanimous. Second item are the minutes of March 27th, 2014. Does anyone have any comments, corrections, or motion on that? No, I'll move they be accepted as printed. Any motion? Second. Okay, any discussion? I'll be abstaining from this vote. Okay, all in favor? That is six in favor, one abstain. I think that is the first omission I saw on Linda's part in a year and a half of <laughs> minute taking, so. <laughs> the streak is ended, but thank you. And, uh, warrants, do we have any questions on the warrants? We'll start with Tom. Um, no, I believe that they represent the budget items, and uh, I have, have any questions if I had, I've had answered. Mike, no questions. Sharon? Um, just a couple. I just noticed that there's like three different items for um, de-icer for salt, and I'm wondering if it's road, and one is bulk control what page? on page one, about halfway down American rock salt, and then the next one is Cargill for de-icer on page two, and the third one is page six for international salt. So they're three different companies. And that is correct. We actually contracted with three different companies this year, uh, concerned about supply, okay. and as it turned out, it was a wise move on our part. Uh, you may have read in the papers where people were falling short on salt supplies, mm -hmm. but because we had contracted with all three, we were able to keep the salt flowing. Okay, and this hopefully is the end of the salt bills. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's all I had. James? No, sir. Justin? I had nothing. Yeah. All set. All right. 
much are done. Next item is citizens. If there are any citizens in the audience that would like to come up and address this uh, select board and the people of Bennington, we can invite you to come up to this microphone. Please identify yourself, uh, your relationship with the town, whether you're a resident, business owner, etc., or if you represent an organization. And, uh, Hi, my name is Doris Lemire, and I'd like to talk about um, regional affordable housing. I'm going to give you a couple of papers. Thank you. You can show me. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. As a taxpayer, I was quite offended by the remarks that were made here by Broderick, the Regional Affordable Housing Director. He said most of the apartments, houses in the town of Bennington were below standard. Well, me as a taxpayer and a homeowner and a renter, I have to save my money to uh, do any improvements, but regional affordable housing gets a grant about every five years to redo their place, but their property valuation stays the same. And if you can look on there, it's Roaring Branch, regional affordable housing, they don't pay their share, fair share of taxes. So on the grand list, we as taxpayers in the town of Bennington have to make up the difference. Willowbrook Beach Court, I think they only pay $28,000 to the town of Bennington. That's it. That's not fair to us. You know what? We cannot have any more low-income housing in this town. We need industry. We need something that people can work at and make money. This is not fair to us as landlords. All right, Doris, thank you. Um, so, I mean, th this would have been nice to have at the hearing two weeks ago. Um, I didn't Don's know not. that that guy was coming in. The, these meetings are warned, and it, you know, this is a good point. Um, he just came in and demanded an answer that night. Oh, he, Am the, I the correct? Meeting, no, the meeting was warned, and the public hearing was warned. We, we can't have an agenda item without a warned meeting. It's, it's the public has to be notified uh, that it's going to be on the okay. agenda. Now, a lot of people don't see it. Right. I mean, I've, I've missed things, you know, before I was on the board, and, and, and we want people to pay attention and, mm -hmm. and one of the things I want to see is to get more people involved in these mm -hmm. discussions and whatnot. Um, I was not happy that we had such a, a short amount of time to make a decision on that. Um, I, I'm, I still think going forward with the grant, uh, the town, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable stopping, I don't comfortable with my vote, but it <coughs> would be right to have another public hearing without Mr. Broderick here to answer for it on, a, on an item that's already been decided. However information like this that you have or anything like that, if you'd like to present it to the board, if you'd like to follow up with the mm -hmm. letter, I'd be happy to look at it and discuss it mm -hmm. with, with the town and the assessors and see if that's it's just a that fair item. As you, d did you know that, that they don't pay their fair share of taxes? Well, Most people is, don't. What is the is that they pay, they pay taxes based on the may, assessment may I, of the town. So. May I speak on that? In fact, yes. and, and um, Stu, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, what RAC agrees to do is base it on the income that they are provided. And you, I believe, as a property owner, are given the same opportunity if you provide what it is you get with respect to rents to get the same My discount. My rents are right. equal to his. And Jim, that, I don't want to, Jim, can hold on. I don't want to open this discussion back up. This is, I mean, we had a public hearing. No, I think it that's, it, that's on, and I, th I don't think it's fair to do that <coughs> without Mr. Broderick here, okay. without reopening the issue, and the issue has been voted on and passed. Okay. And I appreciate I, you bringing it to our attention. Okay. Um, and this is one of the reasons that I like to have time between <coughs> the discussion and the vote, so that okay. people. I think. I think. A, 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 but I think that's an important an clarification yeah, to be made. I agree. But I think an, it, we need to have an atmosphere where people feel like they had time to voice their opinions before uh, we convene on a vote. So, right. um, and I do appreciate that. I've heard from a few voters um, when I've had discussions. I'd before. like an answer from Stu, though, please. Well, Jim, 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 well, I, 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 I don't want to go. I don't want to open it. I'm not going to reopen. I'm assuming. That I'm assuming we're going to do this at another. Right. We'll, we'll schedule an agenda right. item. We can make okay. an agenda item on. I, I'd like to pursue that assessment because my understanding is they pay taxes. They pay taxes. The taxes should be 
should have a track record. But there is there is one right there. Qu qu right. clarification I would like to make. Yeah. And that is the the housing authority properties pay in lieu of tax payment. Right. Because they are federally funded uh, housing authority and under the law they are only required to pay and in lieu of tax payment. Right. So that's why their payment is so low. Right. Uh, I've got a couple comments I'd like to make to just to follow up to what Doris said. <clears throat> I was absolutely not happy with the way we pushed that through the other night. I had a lot of questions that I wanted answers to that we did not have the time frame to get answers to before we had to push that grant through. I voted against it. I'm not comfortable ever voting in favor of anything that I have questions about before we have answers. Um, we need to make sure as a board that we don't allow that to happen again in the future. Uh, you, you know, that being said, if you come to me and you want an answer tonight and I don't have the answer, the answer is no. If I have questions, I need answers to it before I can vote on it. I, I'm still very uncomfortable with this. Um, I, I see some faces in the audience that I know are here for this issue. I've had multiple phone calls since this has happened. I would like this board to reconsider at least putting a hold on this as it was passed until we can get the answers to the questions that we asked. I can't make that motion because I voted in the minority, but I would like one of you to at least consider putting a hold on this until we have the answers to the questions that were asked here three weeks ago because I still don't have them tonight. All right, well, we'll see if we can get those back. Tom? Um, I'm not willing to offer that motion, uh, but I do think uh, that it's appropriate uh, to be considering the, the process. Uh, the process is, doesn't work. Uh, citizens should have the opportunity to speak to a subject before we vote on it. We should also have the information. I think we should have a policy that anything that requires a vote of this board should not be voted on just automatically at the time it's presented, but it should be delayed at least till the next meeting to give opportunity for the citizens as well as the board to inquire. Uh, and I think we should be looking at that policy, and I'd like to examine and develop one to answer not just this, but other issues that have come up. Well, I think I, I'd like to say that I think that's part of my responsibility as the chair um, setting the agenda is to make sure that the board has enough time to gather facts <coughs> comfortable with with the opinion and for the public to have confidence in that john speaking to tom's point um i know the, the meetings are warned and we get to see that information right. but the public gets to hear that information after the first meeting so it's warned we talk about it the public right. now knows about it now they're ready to speak about it's it we very had, often the case more had, than what the original so we need to was. take that into consideration when setting this up because i think there was a, a certain level of disrespect towards our voters, the people that voted us into these positions by making a decision because someone came up unprepared yeah. and gave us a short amount of time when he was looking for a, a large sum and of I, money. Yeah, and I think that um, the, the understanding needs to be out there for people who have opportunities for grants that need public hearings. Uh, if they have a short deadline, they need to get in touch with us, get on an agenda, and give us time to consider the proposal. Uh, if, if they want to do that, just understand that there's a process that, that the citizens deserve. And, um, you know, we, we have had special meetings before where we can meet in between meetings to sign something or, or, or get paperwork done. But uh, I, I think it's important for the citizens to be comfortable that we've gone through the due process. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Doris. I appreciate that. Thank you. Can I hang on to about the meeting tonight, of course. My name is John Hale. Thank you. John Hale? Yep. I'm, I'm a business owner in town. I, I'm not a resident, so I don't have a vote. On That's fine. Things just, that happen I just here, like so to know for people. I didn't vote for any of you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, not to beat a dead horse, but I came up here to ask you to reconsider your vote on the grant to regional or Shire Housing, really. Um, I'm a landlord. I'm a contractor. I'm, I own several businesses in town. I buy dilapidated buildings, renovate them, turn them into rental units, either that or I resell them. And if you put this in a private investor's opportunity to do this, he could not possibly make something like this work at the rents that he's charging. For 24 units to be $5.5 .5 million, it's $230,000 a unit. That's an $1,100 mortgage payment on its own in a 20-year 5% interest loan, plus water, plus taxes, plus upkeep of buildings. For me to do that, I would go under very quickly to rent a two-bedroom apartment for $800 a month with everything included. It couldn't possibly work. It puts a guy in, in my position very difficult to keep my properties up kept because I have to compete with his rents. My rents are reasonable. I, I try to make my rents affordable to the people in this town. I just bought a large property in town and we're renovating it into 11, 11 apartments. 
for you know upper uh, working middle class people that come here to work for the industry that we're trying to attract, supply housing for them. You know, I understand that we have to supply housing for lower incomes, and I do that as a business person, but there has to be a balance here. And for me to try and make my business work, this, he's selling a brand new car where I'm a used car salesman, and he's undercutting my price. So. Well, again, I, I don't want to open a, a public hearing on this without Mr. Brown, well, but I, I think we, you've made your point. Well, my, my request is just that you reconsider this grant and really think about the consequences that happens to the people that are really trying to make a business happen in this town. That's all I'm, I'm requesting. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Greg, can I ask a question? Yes, John. Um, I know we're going to try and put this on the next agenda, but how much time do we have available when it comes to putting this on hold? If we wait another two weeks, is it already a done deal? My understanding is that the application went in, had to be in last week, so that the approval is on an application. I have voted a, on it. Yeah, that it yeah. voted and went through. I don't know that there's an opportunity to put it on hold or anything um, beyond that, but. Um, you know, we can we can see what the board wants to do, and if you want to at least discuss it to length. But um, it, as far as that grant, I believe our signature is already on it, and it's it, can I ask a question, Stuart? Yeah. Stuart, do you know if we could rescind our our um, our approval of that? I mean, could we could we refuse the funds in, in lieu of getting any questions answered? Um, I'm going to say I think so. The grant application is in. Uh, Greg is correct. It had to be in very quickly. Um, so if the grant is then there, there, therefore approved, or it follows that it gets approved, and I don't know what the how long the process is for the review of applications. Uh, so I think if we take it up at our next meeting again, and the board wants to take an action that is different from the first, that we can enter that action into the record uh, with the Vermont Community Development Block Grant Program. Stu, there are in fact no town funds involved in this, right? No, there are none. Correct. One more question. Um, when we accepted this, I believe there's a contingency that we wanted to hear more information, that we were accepting it based on for the facts coming in the future, right? So if we find something that we don't like, what did we actually leave, our, leave ourselves in terms of wiggle room if, um, if we don't have that opportunity? Have to look at the minutes. Well, well, without having researched the question, I, I, yeah. I think there's an opportunity for the board when the grant is offered to <coughs> simply not accept it. Right. So, okay. I mean, I think I think pretty much with taking the, with accepting the, the um, motion, we we put it in mo into motion and they apply for a grant. Okay, we're not giving them money; they're applying for a process which they may or may not get. And then at that end point, the money gets presented to the town. But so. the grant goes through us, so we can refuse it or accept it so. on his behalf. But That's we should probably discuss that as an agenda item when we have information. Um, Yes, sir. Hi. My name is Ingemar Canastrassi. Sorry, what do you mean again? Ingemar Canastrassi. Okay. He's going to do this. And I have a food concession stand. And I'm looking, I'm trying to get a spot, um, 225 Northside Drive, which I'm okay to, to be there. Um, the problem is, is my trailer is bigger than what the ordinance says I can, that it'll allow. Um, but I'm going to be on private property. I'm not going to be in a spot like on Main Street or somewhere. I know the restrictions they have are basically because of a small parking space. Um, I think I can speak on, with some familiarity on this. <laughs> I'm sorry? I think I can speak with some familiarity on this. <laughs> yeah. And I believe that if it's on private properties, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Stu, that uh, he's basically allowed to uh, put it there. He is allowed to put it there. He does need a permit to do so, and I believe the decision of the permit office was that in order for him to use a larger uh, facility than would normally be allowed, he would need a waiver from the board, and I think that's why he's here. Yeah, today. that's what I'm, I'm asking for, because yeah. that's what the uh, ordinance says. What are the dimensions of your cart? Excuse me? What are the dimensions of your cart? Uh, it's 19 feet, and the largest they say is 12 feet in the ordinance. Because hmm. I think Neil Shulman's card was more than 12 feet, and he had it at uh, the gun shop. I agree. Mm -hmm. I'm just <coughs> where, relaying what the permitting office uh, told 225 Northside Drive was the American Legion parking lot. Gotcha. So I'll be off the beaten path, and okay. I won't be in anybody's way. It's not like I'll be taking up 
space of will be obstructing traffic or anything like that. Have, have you made a request of the town for a, a variance or anything like that to, with the details? So I'm thinking if we could get a. a, a in, in fact, there is. There is no variance. Oh, Dan's okay, good. Mr. Mr. Monks, if you have something you can add to this. Actually, I spoke with Mr. Kenshaw okay. about this. And I, it, the, the ordinance is very clear that you folks have specific authority to waive this. So in order not, there may be other property owners who feel that it's inappropriate for Mr. Conestrasi to be where he is, even though he has every right to be there, but for this size requirement. It's very important, I think, for you folks to weigh in on this. If you feel comfortable with the size of his uh, facility, He's all set, he meets all the other standards, and there is a specific allowance in the ordinance for a waiver. Dan, the Dan. Owners hang, hang on, can we, can we just, sure. just yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, I think this is a really good example of something where we might want to get some details and put it on our next agenda. Right. Um, uh, does that create any problem for you? I, I was hoping to be set up by we, Friday. <laughs> I, I just ask a couple questions? Okay, um, well, let's, let's start over at this end. These, um, Justin had his hand up. The property owners allowing you the space that you need to use I mean they're okay with the, the size yeah of the yeah everything is all okay yeah <clears throat> I've got everything that I need except for like uh, Dan Monks had told me the only thing I don't fall under is because of the size right I've got a that question was the only issue for Dan Dan do you recall offhand I think with respect to a, a competing business there has to be X number of feet and is is he within he is okay Requirement is 100 feet. Yeah. <coughs> I, uh, yeah. Okay. And that's legit. Okay. John, you understand? Would you be able to put two carts that are 12 foot by 12 foot back to back? Well, they, you would <laughs> in have that, to. In that same spot? In the same business, you mean? Like yeah. instead of one 20 footer? Right. It'd be two permits. It'd be two, two permits. permits. So, okay. I guess that's where I was going with this. It would be if yeah. if we were uneasy I, about anything, then yeah. two permits might be able to. If it's just the size to. of the vehicle. Yeah. Tommy, Can, Oh, have you uh, talked with any of the neighbors that might be impacted by the uh, size of your unit? I have not, because I, I didn't really see it being a problem because of where it was. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be off the road in a parking spot. Mm -hmm. And all, they're all commercial properties around you anyway, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, it's all commercial. I wonder if we could give him tentative approval until we get more information so that he could... Um, get up and running. I'm so well, he'd have, you're talking about buying a permit for, on a tentative basis. Um, is this a is this a trailer that you're going to be leaving there, or does it pack up and go every day? Um, I, I would like to leave it there. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be going periodically because I may be doing some fairs and events, other events. I'm not going to be specifically there every single day. You know. And is this a seasonal? Um, depends on. <laughs> You know, how many Weather. people I get. If, if I still have people that want to buy in the cold, I'd like to stay open. <laughs> yeah, I know somebody that does that. Just, yeah, I do too. I it, I, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> but it's a tough... Hey, it's, we got to do what we got to do, right? You got it. You got to pay the bills, man. <laughs> I'd move the allowance on this waiver. Okay, any discussion? All right, no discussion. We have a vote. All in favor? We'll vote to waive that. There are, that was unanimous, and we luck. Grant the waive. But not too much luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Y'all have good summers. Okay. Uh, next thing is um, Mike Harrington's going to make an introduction. Yeah, and I actually have uh, just a quick piece under citizens. Um, and just introduce Mike Harrington as our economic development community development director. Thank you. Right. Introduced here. Uh, in reference to the uh, before topic about uh, Shire's housing, uh, I just felt it appropriate that the board be aware that um, the organization is actually uh, moving forward with acquiring additional funding uh, throughout this week and next week. Um, so just know that uh, our grant application is only a portion of the funding and they're in the midst of uh, acquiring additional funding as we speak. So just as you're looking to either rescind or uh, reevaluate, um, the entire project is contingent on the part that we agreed to as well. Um, we're getting a housing study presented yeah. at some point. Is that, when does that come? It'll probably be uh, just to get it on the agenda with enough notice, probably mid, mid to end May. 
Thank you. All right, let's move on. Great. Uh, the next piece on the agenda is the Career Week and specifically the Southshire Challenge, uh, which was put on uh, by the educational system. And I know there's uh, a really sharp group of students that are here tonight, along with uh, some others, to share about the different events. But to give you a little bit of background, the Southshire Challenge was put together uh, with six different challenges, and they were different business challenges. And each challenge was divvied up amongst the different schools. Uh, specifically, the town had one that it was participating in with Shaftesbury uh, Elementary. Uh, so a number of different classes have worked with uh, these different, uh, I guess, um mock challenges, if you will, and have come up with some really great ideas, and I'll let uh, the group really explain a little bit more about it, but it's been going on, um, I would say, probably since uh, it was originally started talking about, which was the early school year, uh, so maybe a little over six months ago, uh, and I think the, the classes that have worked on it and the students that have worked on it have uh, come a long way in what they're looking uh, to present to you tonight is a, a, a finished or semi-finished product that I think you'll all enjoy. So I'm going to pass it off to uh, Bob Marine, who's going to share a little bit more about the project and MC the event tonight. Thanks, Mike. Actually, um, I think he did most of my talking for me. I can get rid of the first two pages right away. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. So, no, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, the Southshire Challenge is a wonderful collaboration between the businesses in Bennington and the school system in Bennington, including the private schools. This is all schools in Bennington where we're able to pick up a challenge from a local business. It's great working together. Uh, they said, as Mike said, they started in September with an introduction to the teachers, and I'm sure that, that Peter and, and Jeannie Jenkins and Catherine McClure were working on this through the summer to make it happen. And it's a wonderful first step in seeing some really good work done between uh, businesses, kids in the schools where they could possibly lead to future jobs, show the kids that this is a great place to live, work. There are businesses out there. There's a lot of industry and they're looking for training people in that business. So it's a great opportunity. And step one was like Mike said, go ahead and let's get some challenges from some certain businesses. Step two was to have some schools introduced to those challenges and pick those up. And then step three was to get them together and they've been working, like Mike said, since probably October. Um, we have actually six businesses in our first year of the Southshire Challenge. We have Abacus uh, Automation, Global Z International, uh, k &E Plastics, Old Castle Theater, um, the Town of Bennington, and Southwestern Vermont Healthcare have all made a challenge and been accepted by some group in this, uh, in this area. Um, today we're going to highlight just four of those groups and I'm going to let them introduce themselves when they come up and talk about what group they're in and how they did it. And we do really appreciate the time and we'll try to keep them on a stopwatch and we have a big hook in the back. So um, this is our first group is from the town of Bennington um, and I think Mike worked with them. Laura? <laughs> I'm Laura Cabo. This is my teaching partner, Mr. Phelps. We are fourth grade teachers at Chesterfield Elementary School. These are a few of our students who are not on vacation this week, who have come to present to you what we've been working on. And we are not done yet, but we have had an amazing experience with the town of Bennington, who is our partner. Okay, you guys ready? The fourth grade from Shaftesbury Elementary School is participating in the South, South Shire Challenge. We have been partnered with the town of Bennington to solve the following problem. What would a space look like where students could come to create, invent, study, and learn? It should be a space where kids can go with their families and it should be located in Bennington County. We use the engineering designing process to guide our work. Ask, imagine, plan, create, improve. Our first step was to imagine what this space would look like. We worked in small groups. Mr. Michael Harrington, Bennington Economic and Community Development Men director visited our class to talk about the challenge. 
and some of the boundaries that we would have to consider. This is my group, and the ones we liked the most were the animal room, the gym, and the computer lab. This is our groups, and our favorite rooms were the fashion room, the video game room, and the cooking room. Our next step was to create a master list of all our <coughs> ideas. We then thought went through each item on the list and sorted them into four categories. Create, invent, study, and learn. Some items had to be crossed off because they did not fit into the categories. Like the Chuck E. Cheese room. <laughs> that was not my idea. <laughs> Every student made a drawing of their own space. Mr. John Shanahan, director of the Better Bennington Corporation, we reviewed our individual drawings and created a plan with a goal. To create a space where young people can go to prepare for the future by inventing, creating, learning, practicing, and having fun. A vision, a location that has all the rooms, teachers, equipment, and supplies needed to achieve the goal. <coughs> Plan. Share ideas, design a space, find a location, create the space, <coughs> offer the space, pay for it. He sorted our ideas into categories and pointed out the things that we don't already have in Bennington. We, he even made us a blueprint. Currently, we are all working on our own design of one of the rooms from the blueprint provided by Mr. Shanahan. Some of us are creating 3D model and a 3D model in a shoebox. Some of us are learning how to create a room using Google draw a Google drawing program. We can't wait to share our final product with you May 7th from 6:30 p.m. to 7:30 p.m. in the Shaftesbury School Library. We really hope that you will come. Thank you. Beautiful. We, one of the cool things about the South Shire Challenge is there is no age requirement. There's, we have elementary schools all the way through the high school uh, and the CDC working. Our next group is uh, representing Old Castle Theater Company and the perfect name for this group too because they're the South Shire Community School. And Ann, if you want to come up and, and here we go, number two. Six students ages 10 to 14 worked a total of 30 hours over three months. Throughout this playwriting process, we had an enormous, help, uh, an enor an enormous amount of help from Jerry Q. Two days a week, she came to our school and taught us everything we learned. Before writing the play, Jerry made us write separate scenes to improve our play playwriting abilities. As we improved, we began to write the scenes that would later make up our play. The play was originally six scenes that had nothing to do with the, each other at all. The guidelines for the scenes were that there was no stage directions, no more than three people, it took place in one area, and that it was only 15 lines. As we pieced them together and made them into a play, we added many, so many more lines that it would be exhausting to count them all. Putting all the scenes together was a challenge. We, also, we had to come up with background stories for characters. We also had to write new scenes to make the play work together. Making characters connect with each other was also a challenge. The play consists of 10 characters, two families, and two friends. At first, you don't think that the play will come together to solve all the problems, but in the last scene, all the characters come together for a resolved ending. The play talks about the Oklahoma bombing and PTSD. One of the main characters, Tony, suffers from PTSD and slowly unravels throughout the play. The use of a magical dog helps Tony get help from a past friend. She has helped raise Angie, a character whose family was killed in the bombing. Two carpenters help Angie find a future on her own. The play ends with Tony walking off stage with a past friend to get help and recover from her illness. The things that were challenging when writing the play was writing a scene and having to throw it out. 
But Jerry Q always used to tell us that artists make garbage, and every single time that we would work together, we always had to say it. Throughout the class times, we really became a family. We trusted each other, learned from each other, and really enjoyed it. I, I really did try to get them to actually come out and do a, a few lines from the play. I think it would be great. I didn't really want to do it in front of Dan, I think. Um, but no, it would be really great and a, and a wonderful topic. It, it shows the depth of our, of our young adults. They really know how to deal with some things and how to write about it too, so it's great. Our next uh, group is from the high school and it's uh, Abacus Automation. Good evening. I'm Neil Hogan. I'm a, a teacher at the Career Development Center. Uh, I teach uh, accounting and finance, and I teach in the marketing program. And Brooke Remington uh, from the uh, high school, Mount Anthony Union High School, and she teaches in the senior project program. And uh, Katie, William, and Austin are going to present uh, our challenge, which is a product challenge from uh, Abacus. separate website for the product itself was an easier way to you know, sell it. The only other ways we were really finding this or the competitors was eBay. And, and there's people that use eBay, there's people that don't. <coughs> find them. 
trust it. So having its own website was a uh, we thought was a easier and better way to sell the product. We just did this just as an example. I mean, there's still a lot to do with it, but I think that's about it. I think you can, you can tell just from that presentation that these young adults are ready just to go into business. I mean, they know what they're doing way more than I do. Um, our last presentation today uh, in the South Shark Challenge is from the Southwestern Vermont Healthcare System. Rachel. Uh, my name is Rachel Schindler, and I'm an AmeriCorps VISTA serving this year at Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. Um, and I am here to talk about our challenge that we presented. Um, unfortunately, the students that helped us um, out on it all must have left the state for spring break. Um, <laughs> so I'm here on my own. Pass those down the line. Um, so when the South Shire Challenge was first brought to um, us, it was actually brought to my supervisor, um, Jim Tremarkey, the director of planning, and he passed it off to me. Um, and when it was first presented to us, we were told to think of a problem that our institution faces every day that we can give to a group of students to solve for us. Um, and as a healthcare institution, we face nothing but problems on a daily basis. Um, and so we weeded through a lot of them to find one that we really wanted a group of students to help us out on. And what we came down to is youth nutrition. Um, healthcare is at a really interesting point right now where there's a shift going on and healthcare institutions are really going to have to start <coughs> thinking about how to prevent disease to improve community health instead of just treating disease. And so um, as a healthcare institution, we know that the choices individuals make in childhood and in adolescence really play a profound role in their health later on at life. And so we knew that to really improve the health of our community, we needed to start with our, our youngest generation, um, ideally middle school. And so that was the target of our challenge. We really wanted a group of middle schoolers to help us out on. Um, and so, um, we wanted a group of middle school students to create a fun and exciting video um, that would convince their peers and influence peers um, to make healthier behavior choices um, to improve their health. And so we originally took it to a middle school health class um, and they, they took a survey for us about what are the biggest health challenges that they face. And one of them that came up was um, sugary drinks is that they, they just, it was too, too easy to access sugary drinks and um, that was one of the biggest health challenges. Um, after a couple of weeks, we realized that trying to do this challenge with 20 students um, was a little tough. Um, and so we ended up moving away from that class and we found two middle school students to work with us. And we actually paired up with Tim Foley, who is here tonight. Um, he is the instructor at the CDC for the video production class. And so we teamed up with him because I really know nothing about video production and didn't know how to teach it to <coughs> middle schoolers. Um, so we teamed up with him and one of his students, um, a senior in the video production class, um, to help us out with making this video. And so during the after school hours, the two middle schoolers went there for a few weeks. They wrote the script for the video um, with the student Blake, the senior, um, with his help. He um, helped them film it and he did a lot of the editing for us. And so it really turned out really well. Um, and so we actually have it here tonight. It's a quick PSA style two and a half minute video to try and influence um, youth to avoid sugary drinks. Um, so. Maybe we should turn the light down. <laughs> In a world. dominate the market. Two kids get more than they pay for. 
<laughs> Coming soon to theaters near they put together I think they had a lot of fun with it um, they did a play off of um, a pretty well-known energy drink that's pretty high in calories um, and I think the key to our challenge not only was trying to get youth <coughs> to make healthier um, decisions but to really have youth influence their peers um, we know that youth don't really listen to adults when it when it comes to things. There's a lot more influence to be had among their peers. So that was one of the key things we were really trying to emphasize is having um, the youth actors, having the youth um, put together the script. Um, it was really about that peer-to-peer -peer influence. Um, and if, if you happen to know any of the students that were involved in this challenge or see them around town, um, please you know give, give them a shout out and um, <laughs> tell them thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So in closing, thank you very much. Thanks for the time. Uh, I know you guys are very, very busy. Um, the Southshire Challenge is in its very first year. Uh, we'll be back again next year. It's not a one and done thing, but it's a one and build on it thing. Uh, we have a lot of businesses that aren't involved this year that will be next year. And we met with Chris Harriman from the U.S. Small Business Administration. She wants to be part of this next year also. And I think that, uh, I think just a just a little teaser on how much talent our young people have. And as long as we challenge them, I think they will rise to that occasion for sure. And thank you once again. And thank you for everybody who came out. Thank you. We have um, a Youth Appreciation Day coming up on May 3rd. People should keep an eye out. I guess the date was just, just hammered down up at Willow Park. Rachel actually is in charge. And Rachel, um, I was going to say I was talking to Mickey about that. So keep an eye out for that. That sounds like a really great event coming up. And uh, as you say, we can talk all we want. If the youth don't chime in, it doesn't really do a lot of good. So. Let me clean up all this mess. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll take care. We're just going to let everybody. There's people clearing out. We're just getting them a second. We're going to get Mike Harrington up for uh, another subject here in just a second. <clears throat> the next item on the list is the Pleasant Street Enhancement Project update, which is again uh, Michael Harrington from the town office. Top that. Just going to rotate sides here. Yeah. We have a, a drawing for you that we'll put up as well for the public. And Dan, uh, you can grab a shot of that as well. The uh, you may remember, and I think everybody was here when we brought this, uh, the conceptual plans to you uh, early on, uh, except for Mr. Keene. Uh, but the uh, Pleasant Street Enhancement Project uh, was a grant uh, that was awarded to the town. 
many years ago, uh, I believe around 2009. Uh, and uh, over the course of the past year, uh, we've been working very closely with uh, two gentlemen from Stevens and Associates out of Brattleboro uh, to put together the uh, design drawings and engineering uh, information that's required as part of the, the grant. Uh, about 80% uh, of the funding comes through uh, the state of Vermont through the, the federal highway fund uh, and then uh, the town had pledged a local match of 20% uh, for this particular project. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to the two guys here that are going to give you a little <coughs> bit more information but essentially to give you uh, just uh, an understanding of tonight's meeting uh, this is considered uh, the uh, I guess it's the public concerns meeting or public update meeting uh, as required by uh, the grant process and VTRANS. So we're going to share just where we're at. We'll answer any questions you have, but really it's about uh, public information. Great. Two things, Mike. Uh, yes. Just one question. Uh, are you looking for anything from us tonight? Not as far tonight. As, well, this is just a procedural update. Yep. Thank you. And yep. also the, the documents we get, as you know, are very small. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if in the future we can look at <laughs> utilizing our projector <laughs> facilities so some of us yeah. even with a little magnifying glass I can't read what can't these do. things say. Thank you very much. Yep, we'll do that in the future. So I have uh, Corey Frizzi and John Sadik who's behind me and I'll let them uh, give their little presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, my name's John Sadek. This is Corey Friese. We're from uh, Stevens and Associates. The town retained us. We've been working on this project with Michael and the town for about a year now. Uh, we're here just to give you an update and, uh, and entertain any questions. Uh, we're at about 25% complete drawings right now. The trans process uh, breaks things up to uh, conceptual which we sat down and we talked about last year. I think it was at the June, June 10th uh, select board meeting. We got to go ahead to, uh, to continue with the concept and here we are with 25% plans. We go through 60% plans for VTRANS and they have a review, 90%. And then hopefully by uh, the end of the year, we'll have the documents in order so that we can put together a bid package with the town and send this thing out to bid. Uh, Project area, uh, basically both sides of School Street from Pleasant down to Maine, and then the uh, north side of Pleasant Street from the intersection with School all the way past the bank parking lot down to the town parking lot. And what the streetscape improvements include are new curbs, new sidewalks, new wider sidewalks on both sides of School Street and one side of Pleasant Street. Uh, lighting, new, uh, the period lighting that we have on the main street, we're gonna introduce, we're gonna introduce uh, six, six new fixtures along the, uh, along the side of the TD Bank. Uh, take off the existing uh, luminaires that are on the utility poles along School Street. And as part of the sidewalk widening, uh, relocate those utility poles and the utilities uh, further away from the buildings. One of the issues that we, we discovered was that there's a difficulty in the winter plowing between the buildings and those poles. So the concept here is to narrow the, the roadway a few feet and widen the sidewalks on either side so that the plows can get through between the buildings and the poles, both the uh, relocated utility poles and the, uh, and the street lights. Along with, uh, along with the curbs and the sidewalks and the lighting, we're introducing uh, some planting along School Street on the, uh, be on the west side and then along the TD Bank. We've been talking to the folks there about incorporating some planters along the length of School Street and then up around the corner onto Pleasant Street. Not unlike those concrete curbs planters that are along the, uh, the far side of the TD Bank now. And those planters would have some shrubs in them, possibly a, a railing and, and some street trees uh, along the way there. Uh, also, there's going to be a couple uh, minor drainage improvements. There's some catch basins that have to be uh, uh, reset, relocated when the new curbs go in. And 
patching the pavement where the new curbs go and then possibly an overlay. And we're working with, uh, we're working with the town now to see if there be some sharing with uh, the town and they're scheduled to do the repaving and the patching as the project goes on. We've also been working with, uh, with the budget for the, uh, for the actual construction and we're at about $170,000, $180,000 and we're keeping that steady. Right now we have a couple of ad alternates. If we could get concrete curbing in there rather than, uh, I mean if we get granite curbing in there rather than concrete, we'd, we'd like to do that. Uh, we also might, if it works out, put in a brick strip along the inside of that granite curb just as an accent to, uh, to uh, in increase the uh, aesthetics along the way there. One of the next things that's part of the process and uh, we're just, we've initiated with some of the landowners is to sit down and talk about temporary easements for construction and permanent easements. With these projects, it's always nice if you can work within the highway right of way or with the roadway right of way, but a lot of times you're right up against the right of way and during construction you're on somebody's front yard. Uh, so the process is to sit down and talk with uh, the four landowners, there's three on one side and then TD Bank on the other, and come to an agreement that during construction it'll be okay if, if the equipment is on their property and, uh, and uh, things are put back exactly the way they were or better after the project is over. Uh, along with the temporary construction easements, there's also a permanent uh, easement that's going to be required and we've sat down and we've had some discussions with the TD Bank people. Uh, the, the curbed planters with the trees that would go up the side of the, the bank parking lot and around the corner from School Street on to Pleasant Street would be located on the TD Bank property. So what we need to do is we need to sit down with them and negotiate a permanent easement, work out maintenance, and, uh, and, and, and come to an agreement on, on how that's going to be uh, uh, negotiated. So that is the update in a nutshell. Uh, Corey is an engineer. I'm a site planner, landscape architect. We've been rec working with Michael all along. If you have any questions, we'd certainly like to hear them. Start down the send. Any, Tom, you have anything? What's the timeline for getting from uh, this part to the actual construction? If we stay on track, and so far VTrans has been very receptive, and we've been keeping up with them, and they've been keeping up with us, our optimistic, our optimistic schedule is to get this thing ready to go to bid and award it so construction can take place next year, sometime you know, after, after the spring next year. But essentially the same question, do you have a, if, if everything goes according to plan, what would be your end date when this would be fully ready? It should just be one construction season. If we can do it next spring, it would be okay. done, it would be done next, next spring, summer. Thank you. Sharon? Um, the only question I had, you said you're going to make the street narrower. I'm assuming that's School Street. Correct. Will we lose parking? Good point. I didn't mention that. No. Uh, we talked about that at the June meeting. At one point, we were, we were thinking about narrowing the road to the point where we would lose parking on one side. But this plan here and the plan in your packet indicates that parking is retained on both sides of School Street. And the one thing that is incorporated... <coughs> Up here towards the corner of, uh, of, of the, the bank parking, rather than three parking spaces, we've indicated a bus parking spot here. That was something that came out of our last meeting. Mm. A bus parking with, with the transit center right at the other end of that parking lot? There's a multimodal transit. Right. I think this, that was first. This was actually first recommended bus. by the Better Bennington Corporation because the bus actually parks in the street along School Street right now to let people on and off. That is their right. pickup point. We're trying We're to get them to use the multimodal transportation center, right. so don't make it so convenient for them to be able to park there, please. So that was that was at the recommendation <laughs> of the BBC. Is this, is this tour okay. Buses? You're talking, talking tour buses. Buses. Yankee trail. Well, there's a Yankee Trails big right. bus that comes in every every right. day. And that's the one we're And that's talking. the one that parks, parks in my driveway. It parks right now down by the old Dunkin' Donuts. Right. We're trying to get them to go off to South And the we try, we'd like to get them to use the, the transportation center because that's <coughs> where people 
I mean, we're trying to. Is there a reason they're not that we know of, Michael? Uh, that I'm not. They aware. just don't really want to cooperate with us. I don't think. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I don't I'm know whether sure. it's I mean, ease of access, lack uh, of communication. I think um, on their part. Um, the other question I had is: there's an egress onto School Street from the bank parking lot. Is that going to stay there too? Yes. Between those two trees. All the curb cuts yeah. stay exactly the same. Okay. You see that right there. Okay. But will those, a question, along, I'm sorry, are you done? No, that's, no, okay. that's fine, that's all I. Go ahead, With John. respect to the, the, the um, curb openings, those are really rather precipitous. And I can't tell you the number of times that I hear cars scraping their bottoms. Mm -hmm. What you have there, actually, and we there. talk. So my question is, are they going to be removed or replaced? Well, so the issue you have there uh, is that when the parking lot has been repaved, yeah. it hasn't been ground down. So what you have is layer on top of layer on top of layer. So at one point, that parking lot was actually at street level. Uh, and right now, it's probably about six <laughs> to eight inches or more above street level. And so that's where you're getting the cars hitting as they're heading into the parking lot. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do from the town's perspective because of it being the bank's property. Uh, and I actually pointed that out to the bank manager, uh, who's new, um, last week when we met with them. So. <coughs> Greg, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, you know, I just want to go through the board, and then we'll see if we have any questions. Go ahead. Just on, on the on the bus parking, if we conceptually move forward with that tonight, we can we revisit that at a later date. If I mean, if you're able to get some cooperation. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd really like to have the network be able to address the issue with the bus company if if we can get a hold of yeah, them. It'd just be nice to not lose the parking spaces, considering they're a, they're a half a block up the. Up yeah. the street, and, and so we'll we'll follow up and just find out if there's a specific reason, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's just preference or I'll there's an issue with them using the. the I'll take an educated center. guess at it. I mean, those buses are really long, and that that turn onto Pleasant Street from School Street is difficult for a large vehicle. But that's we made accommodations for that when we actually built and put the driveway in and and widened that. I take it all back. Then. Okay. But that, yeah, that's a conversation we should have while we're yeah. talking about designing a street. We want my the understanding to is the bus does come in uh, either from, I'm not sure, but I believe it comes in from uh, County Street. Uh, either that, or I've down. seen it come down North okay. Street and turn onto Pleasant Street and yep. then make that corner that way too, okay. which is even worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and this, by the way, we're at the 25% plan uh, piece. Okay. So there is certainly uh, opportunity to make minor adjustments. Good time well. to address we that. We can talk about that later. Yeah, I think what we're talking about is really the striping and probably a sign that would indicate, you know, that it's a bus spot. So right. there's plenty of time to, to iron that out. Okay. John? Uh, when looking at the width of the road, I know that you can present a beautiful project, which is happened a number of times and then the one thing that people really harp on is how how wide the road is and um, I was wondering with this road what does it compare to in town what if both if there's parking on both sides um, what is our distance I can't read it on this on this um, PDF that was travel lane with yeah, so it's 10 on each side 10 on each side and what does that compare to um, what it other, is other roads that we have and would you have any thoughts on that in terms of just your Past experience. Ten, ten feet is pretty darn wide. Yeah. What is it now? I would say maybe a, eleven. Main Street might be twelve. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that 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 we heard early on, and one, and one of the things that narrowing uh, the lanes down is that it slows down the traffic, it calms the traffic down. Uh, you have to pay attention when you're going down there, uh, and it's one of it's one of the uh, the goals that that we we set early on in the process. Well, I mean, so just when we when we widened the sidewalks, we took some of that space out of the existing roadway. I think we went from 36 feet wide to 34 feet wide, and you still have the parking on either side. And then we picked up the difference, uh, or hopefully we'll negotiate the difference with, uh, with the bank. Right. And we've heard from ADA concerns, too, that over by the barber shop there that, that you can't get by that sidewalk in a chair or, or any kind of a, an assistance. They can't even plow it? No. Plow in, it. in reference to um, John's comment, <coughs> If we're referencing back to what happened on Jefferson Street mm -hmm. or Jefferson Ave, um, what we what you probably won't run into here is a similar situation because we've accounted for parking on both sides of the street. So there still is a, a ten foot travel lane even when we 
keep the parking. And we already have curbs there. And there's there. already curbs yeah. there, well, too. What's, what's yeah. the width of, say, Elm Street? Because that can be narrow at times and tough to drive you know, I, both I ways. I know that off the top of my head. I just want to make sure that we don't have a beautiful project that people complain about because they can't drive both ways comfortably. Mm -hmm. I think Elm is in the range of 28 to 29 feet wide. Yeah. Which really only allows so this, you to yeah, so this is much larger, so we side. should be yes. fine. Okay. And we're talking about a school neighborhood, and I, I live yeah. there. I don't see any problem with people slowing down through that area, it's, especially when there are kids around there. And it, well, I'm telling you, I know from personal experience, people race through there, and a narrower street would uh, slow them down. You do. Regarding the drainage, uh, we're talking about surface drainage still, right? There's no drainage infrastructure, and that would still be draining to Main Street? Correct. There's there's two catch basins in the project area. One's down here on Main Street and school, and the other one's up here at the corner of Pleasant and okay. school. And they're they're just in a place that will lay out the new curve with the right radii and stuff, which might nick nick the, the top of them, so we might have to move them around and maybe okay. set them up or down. But uh, I don't I don't anticipate. I don't think we're talking about anything down. Right no, the Department of Public Works has indicated that the catch basin at the intersection of Pleasant and School Street needs to be reset so that the water actually drains into it. So okay. I don't think we're replacing the catch basin, but we, we will look at the condition of the structure before we repay the road. Okay, great. I'm going to open that to the public now. Uh, if you wanted to come up and please identify, up to the microphone, please identify yourself. Do you have any questions? Ryan Hassett and I have a uh, business downtown and the only comment that I want to make about busing is I know you're thinking about one type of bus right now but what I'm looking at is tour buses so if we can get tour buses to come downtown and talking to different tour bus companies one of the issues they have about Bennington is trying to get downtown and trying to find a place to park they'll go to the monument they would go to uh, the apple barn and that's it uh, they really don't want to come downtown because it's too difficult, there's no place to park. And if they do find a place, they give everybody about 45 minutes, get back on the bus, let's head north. Mm -hmm. So That's true. They park in front of the bank all the time. Mm -hmm. And have a place for them to park. Um, don't look at just the Vermont Transit bus. Try to look at if we can expand that to tourism. I mean, we always talk about tourism downtown, but we need to start looking at how we're going to get these buses and get them to stay downtown. Mm -hmm. Those buses That's are fairly scheduled, correct? Um, I mean, you know when they're coming, so it, it wouldn't be. I mean, we could do that with signage and say tour bus parking or something well, we like that. We have to find a place for them, and if this is going to be a place, we could say the tour bus can come here. Right now, there's not a lot of places for tour buses to go, and it is scheduled. You contact right. them, you schedule it out, and you have to give them a plan. This is a designated parking place for you from here. You can go to all these different businesses. You can get places to eat, things like that. Mm -hmm. But talking to tour bus companies, that's one of their biggest issues of coming into Bennington. And I think it's probably a matter of education for the tour bus companies so they know where they can park. Mm -hmm. And um, it's Yankee Trails that is the one that comes in. We need to educate them about the transit center so they can consistently come in there every day. Because mm -hmm. they're here twice a day, and they, they park at the... Mm -hmm. Where Chinese they restaurant. <laughs> I want to just Chinese weigh restaurant. in on this for a second. Oh, sorry, are you, are, do you have anything else to add to that, Ryan? That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate I just want to add it. one comment to that. And, you know, as I said, I live right on School Street, and that parking area where he's suggesting is regularly empty. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, well, that's what I'm wondering if we can come up with basis. a situation where if we have a tour bus coming to town, we know it's coming, we put a few cones out, and we, we hold a spot for them. Otherwise, it's parking spaces instead of Make blocking off something for. You know, two weeks out of limited at 15 minutes for like the, in the vendor space, uh, which a lot of people don't pay attention to. <laughs> but, I, I always park in your space. No, I don't. Uh -huh. um, but, um, <laughs> but I'm, you know, I, I, I agree with you. If we're going to have a multimodal center that we spent all this money on, or our taxpayers spent money on, um, we should be utilizing it and linking it up with the Green Mountain Community Network and the parking area and all that type of stuff. But if we have an opportunity for tourist buses to come in and park someplace as a separate entity, um, that was one of the topics that was brought up at the last uh, presentation, and I think I think that's something worth pursuing. And I'm sure that's something that uh, Joanne and, and John from you know from the chamber and the BBC could coordinate with with some of the businesses and and uh, that that deal with the tourist businesses, like Ryan was saying. Anyone else from the 
put on it. So please come up and identify yourself. Hi, my name is Heather Hassett. I'm a resident here in Bennington. And because I don't have superhuman uh, sight, I couldn't tell on the picture if this project extends uh, to the park and pleasant area at all. And if it does, if it addresses going down Pleasant and taking a right onto Park Street, uh, if that's being addressed at all in this project, or if there are intentions. Because it's, if there's a car coming out of Park Street, it, like during school time or what have you, and you're trying to take a right, you absolutely have to stop. You have to swing into the oncoming traffic lane and then uh, continue on to your proper side of the road. So if that is being addressed, fantastic. If it's not. Are we at that point yet, Mike? Right. I this project specifically as it applies to the grant does not cover the intersection of Pleasant so it doesn't and Park. It doesn't go, that that, doesn't okay. go down that far. I, I can say this though, that we are, we are looking at doing uh, improvements to the sidewalk beyond Park Street right. uh, with our own personnel and with our own funds. It's part of the budgeting process and we're... we're right, we've divided the entire Pleasant Street project, as I understand, to, um, between the VTrans project and, and town funds and town work. So that could well come into our sidewalk. Yeah, the turning radius there is very, very difficult. And I think when we redo the sidewalk, we'll be putting in appropriate handicap ramps and we can, we can alter that turning radius to make it a little more easy Great. for people. Okay. All righty. Um, any other board members have any further questions? All right. Nope. Thank you, Michael. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Let's move on. All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is the Deputy Town Forest Fire Warden pre-appointment and also the Fire Warden reappointment. Yeah, so I received today the same uh, paperwork that you received in your packet uh, for the Town Forest Fire Warden himself. This is Matthew Hathaway. Uh, the State of Vermont uh, is recommending the reappointment both of Matthew Hath Hathaway and Henry Higgins. Uh, they are currently the Fire Warden and Deputy Fire Warden, respectively. I move that we accept uh, his reappointment. I'll second that. Okay, second. And any discussion? All in favor? That is unanimous. And I have two things to circulate for signature. There are only five signature lines, so divvy it up and decide how you'd like to sign them. <laughs> <laughs> that covers both of them? Yeah, so okay. there's one for each. One for each, okay. The next item on the agenda is a resolution. Do you want to read resolution? I think the author of the resolution should okay. read it. Tom, would you like to read the resolution, please? This is uh, sure, if I'm trying to find okay. it. Okay. <laughs> I think I have it. You got uh, it? I have a printed copy okay. if you need it. Do you want it? No, I got to read it off here, I think. My voice is not great. <laughs> not great any time. Uh, the, this is the following resolution that I would offer for consideration by the entire board. Resolution being, whereas Joe L. Kosick Jr. has served his country, his state, and town of Bennington, Vermont with distinction, and whereas Joseph L. Kosick Jr. entered the Army at the age of 19 and served for more than 27 years before retiring in 1994 at the rank of Colonel. He served as a cavalry platoon leader in Vietnam in 1969 through 70, where he was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry in action four bronze stars for valor, and two purple hearts for wounds received in combat. And whereas Joseph L. Krasick, Jr. served in the Vermont House of Representatives from 2006 to 2010, and now serves as the president of the Board of Trustees of the Vermont Veterans Home, and whereas Joseph L. Krasick, Jr. was first elected to the Bennington Select Board in 2001, in 2002 he was elected vice chairman and served in that capacity until 2005. He was elected chair in the years 2011, 2012, and 2013, a position that he held until March 31st, 2013, upon his retirement from the select board. And whereas the select board of the town of Bennington wishes to recognize his leadership and wishes to acknowledge his dedicated service to his country, his state, and his community. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the select board of the town of Bennington hereby recognizes, recognizes and thanks Joseph Krasick Jr. for his years of leadership and dedicated service to his country, state, and town, and wish him well as he finds new roads to travel and adventures to experience. Dated at Bennington, Vermont, this 14th day of April, 2014. I would offer that. Move we accept the resolution. Second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? 
All in favor? That is unanimous. Mr. Chair, uh, he actually held his position until March 31st, 2014, so we'll have to make a, an amendment and get it back to you for your signature. We can, we can do that. With all those back and forth, we still missed a date. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I read it just as you. Too many dates. <laughs> too many dates, too little time. <laughs> okay, um, next item on the agenda is the boards and commission schedule. Stuart, can you take us through that? Yes, uh, every, every year we, we, at this time, we, we fill the ver various vacant positions. You have in your packet a list of those positions, um, which include positions on the Development Review Board, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Housing Authority, the Board of Listers, the Planning Commission, and the Regional Commission. Uh, I won't go through how many positions are opening and when the term expires. This will be published, uh, we hope, in, in the banner uh, and certainly uh, carried by WBTN uh, and perhaps on CAT TV, uh, should we get it there. In the past, uh, the board has decided to interview all candidates for office uh, in executive session generally in a, in a meeting before the regular board meeting. Uh, so. Uh, as staff, we're asking you uh, if we have a number of positions that are being sought that are essentially reappointments by long-term serving members, is it necessary to interview those folks and should we think about scheduling them or should we only look to schedule those people who have not served before who the board might want to meet and, in, and uh, be introduced to? Board, any comments on that? I, I maintain Justin. that we should interview every, every candidate for these positions. It's, I think it's been a policy that's been beneficial to see where some people come from that we're putting in influential uh, decision-making positions in the town. It's our responsibility to select these people and do our due diligence. I don't see how we can do it without hearing where they stand. But if we've heard them a number of times before, do we really is, need to interview them again? Has right. John Jacobs heard them? Has John McFadden heard them? I think it was very helpful last year. I didn't know everybody that had come up or had served before, so it was nice for me as a newcomer to listen to what they have to say. And I mean, let's face it, face it we all change from year to year, so <coughs> opinions can change and, and positions can change. So, okay. anybody else? Well, the only thing that I would add is that Jim Carroll and I both served on the board of listers, and I would I would encourage any of our citizens that are listening or watching think about volunteering on one of these boards. Think about putting your name. Uh, you get paid though. Remember, that. Mike. Yeah. Remember how much you made <laughs> from that. Your you get paid at, in that position. Do you remember? So we were able to make that trip to Europe several times a year <laughs> from that money. The um, I tend to agree with Justin and John. Um, when I first joined the board, uh, I thought it was very helpful to know who the people were. I mean, there, was, there were some of them who I had casually met. Some of them I had never met. Uh, they're in influential positions. It may be a little bit of pain for them to come in another night for a meeting or something, but I think I got the feeling from them they appreciated being able to meet the board and and be able to you know make a statement on their behalf and um, in an event where you have a challenged position, if you know, God forbid, we ever have two more people volunteering than we need, um, I don't think it's it's fair to say, well, we're on the board, we don't have to interview you, and somebody okay. else does. That's so <coughs> my stand on it is, I don't um, think it hurts at all. Does anybody feel strongly the other way? Or yeah. Is that? No, that's fine. Good a consensus. Okay, so we'll, we'll basically post this. Uh, we were hoping it would be posted by this date, but I don't think I've seen it in the, in the banner anyway. Um, and if we have some folks in uh, at the next meeting, we'll set up some interviews probably starting around uh, 5 to 5.15, carrying you into the meeting time at 6, and then we'll work our way through this. <coughs> it's a short interview. It's just... Okay. Good chance to ask some questions before the vote. 5:15, if and if I could just make a request, would be best because it gives people a couple minutes to get out of work and scoot over here. So, gotcha. We'll do that, Justin. That, That's no, absolutely. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. We have the liquor and tobacco license applications. Uh, I have a slightly amended list that that was updated um, uh, just this morning. Uh, from the uh, clerk's office. These are all renewals. There's nobody new here, uh, so I will circulate that for your signatures. The new ones being Bennington Pizza House and Plaza? Uh, yes, and I, I believe so. You've got me, Papa John. Pete's. I, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to study it myself. So. Okay. Would it be
be appropriate to start the manager's report? While sure, this go is being ahead, Stuart, if you'd like to. Uh, I first have a couple of announcements to make. Um, uh, May 3rd, as many of you may know, is Green Up Day in Vermont. Uh, we have just received uh, the Green Up bags uh, at the town offices, and those folks who are interested in participating in Green Up Day on Saturday, May 3rd, it generally runs from about 8 a.m. in the morning to 1 p.m. Please register at the town offices with the place or location that you hope to clean up, and that'll facilitate our ability to collect the trash uh, on the following Monday. On May 10th uh, is our Household Hazardous Waste Collection Day at the transfer station. That also runs from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. You must be a resident of Bennington or Woodford at the present time in order to utilize that facility. That is free uh, for the folks in Woodford and Bennington. Stuart, is there anything planned for an electronics recycling day or anything? We had that uh, on a memorial. We, on a we collect day electronics month. recycling every day just that we're open. Regular, but we are one of the state designated electronics collection was, points. There was, well, there was an event on Mayfest uh, a couple years ago where we had a, um, a group downtown that had a bin downtown that was taking for people. Is there anything? That, well, that would have been a special event as far as I know. There's nothing, nothing like scheduled that. now because the state, as you know, the state mandated that, that towns collect those uh, certain items for right. free. Uh, that was just prior to the implementation of the state law. Okay. I'd like so, to just tell you folks that um, uh, after we emptied my parents' house, uh, I went to the Salvation Army and, and they take it on a daily basis. As recycling or just stuff yes, that works? Re no yeah. recycling. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. They'll take anything. So there doesn't have to be a special day for the town to do it. Go ahead, Stuart. Thanks. Uh, and I have two action items for you. Uh, the first is a request from the Bennington Motorcycle Club. Uh, they're seeking to hold a bike night uh, on School Street um, in that block from Pleasant to Maine from 3 p.m. until 8 p.m. on Saturday, July 12th. I incorporated the request from Ernie Thompson, uh, who's a local resident uh, that went through John Shanahan. Uh, I have talked with uh, Chief Doucette, um, didn't have his comments as of the writing of the manager's report, but his only concern would be that uh, perhaps we look to have a law enforcement presence in that area during that time uh, because there are other uh, biking groups that, that might not be as uh, desirable uh, as others. Um, and so we're going to be dealing with the, the, the Bennington International Motorcycle Club uh, to see how we might handle that uh, if, in fact, you folks approve the closing of the street. So we need a motion for that? So yes, I'll please. I'll second it. Okay. Any discussion? Is there a liquor uh, part of this, but beer, wine, or anything? It just says food. No. And uh, they're just going to have one food vendor and some music. There'll be no I don't alcohol know that too. <laughs> Is this an, uh, been something that we've had in the past? Uh, actually, I believe this is a first uh, for us. What's McFlyer think of? Pardon me? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Jim, Jim, are you hired to work this time? I am. Uh, do you think it's appropriate to make the motion if you're hired? I'm just... You're probably uh, right. I shouldn't. Could be a conflict. Yeah. Interest yeah. for the public. If, could, I'd like to put the motion back out. I resent my motion. Okay. I'll move it. Thank you, Justin. I'll second it. Second, Sharon. <laughs> Any other discussion? All in favor? Can I, I shouldn't vote. You shouldn't vote either. That's uh, six in favor and uh, one recusal. You're going to be a <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the second is, is an amendment to the credit card policy, which was originally adopted by this board in April of 2013. Uh, we highlighted the changes. Uh, the original policy uh, put pretty uh, a lot of responsibility on the on the fire chief for the fire department's use of the <coughs> card once they were approved to use it. Um, there were some concerns voiced over the, over the course of the last year. Uh, we have agreed to amend the policy. The fire department has accepted the amendment and it basically makes the treasury of the fire department responsible for reimbursing the town for any unauthorized charges to the card. That's pretty much the, the main change. Uh, it's a policy that has been in place and it's actually been uh, helpful. It actually has helped us. Uh, in a couple of instances, save substantial funds because we can make a credit card purchase where the regular purchase order process would have added costs uh, to the shipping and everything else. So it's worked for us. 
We have a motion on that. I so move to amend the policy. Oh, to Michael. And, uh, second. second. It's James. Any discussion? Is this just for the fire department or is this a town? The only change deals with the fire department use of the card. All departments have access to a card. We have, uh, I believe it's four cards that are out, one for highway, one for water resources, one for the police and fire, and then one that's housed in the manager's office for other purchases that are made throughout the administrative offices. You have to, there's an actual an application for use of the card that has to be approved by the finance director and the manager uh, before the card can be used. But it allows us to do bookings and things like that for travel expenses that uh, actually we were forcing people to use their own cards to do those bookings and then reimbursing them. Yeah, I'm satisfied. Okay. Anyone else? Can you walk me through a situation where um, someone misuses a card, how that would be handled any differently now than it would have been before? Uh, well, the, the only change is in the fire department. In, in the past, we were uh, placing the responsibility for the use of the card on the fire chief, the individual himself or herself. In this particular case, if, if in fact the card was used to book a room and to buy meals, uh, the policy does not provide for the purchase of other things while you're at that uh, particular convention, uh, such as alcohol, uh, movies, other things that you might use when you're staying in a hotel. If those purchases are made by the individuals using the card, the fire department treasury will be required to reimburse the town the, the cost. Anything else? All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you, Stuart. And that's all I have. Okay. Um, so we go to other business. Um, Tom, you have any other business to bring? I don't. Michael? Thank you. Sharon? Um, just want to remind people that construction season has started and they're working on Silver Street and they're working on North Side Drive, so please use caution and be respectful to the workers that are in the highway. James? Yeah, I do have uh, something that I want to talk about. I think many of us here around this table remember uh, Speaker Ralph Wright. Well, his, I grew up with his kids, and his, uh, his daughter, Suzanne, is married to a detective in Florida. And she still is a long-distance Vermonter. And I, contact, or I connect with her and communicate with her, either by phone or through Facebook, on a <coughs> fairly regular basis. And she brought up... Brought to uh, light some information that I thought would be helpful to both um, the citizens of the town and to the police chief as well. And would like to suggest that either the police chief create a flyer or perhaps in conjunction or with cooperation with the Bennington Banner that they write a story about this. And that is um, that drug sales are occurring via social media and they're using code words like Prada, Coach, Starbucks, Seven Up, Good and Plenty, MySpace, and Facebook as code to let people know that drugs are available. In addition to that, Susie forwarded photographs of what this stuff looks like. And prior to prior to me seeing that, I wouldn't have known it. I wouldn't known it, what it, it uh, would have looked like. And I think if the general public were to know what this stuff actually looks like. They look like fairly innocuous uh, things. In one case, they, they look like busted balloons. They've been tied on the end. And these other wax packets, wax envelopes, that if I saw it on a, the street, I wouldn't know what it was. So at any rate, what I'd like to do is suggest that the town manager suggest this to the chief of police um, and go from there. Yes. All right. Okay. Is that it? That'll do it. Justin? I have nothing. Thanks. John? I had a couple of things, not to harp on the housing <coughs> issue, but I had a couple of questions come in over the last <coughs> couple of weeks. I wanted to make sure that I asked them. One question was, are they going to be paying full taxes or are they going to have a reduced rate? Uh, the, the opportunity to appraise property, uh, especially rental property, uh, is either on a cost basis, that is the cost to construct, or on an income basis. All rental uh, properties can be assessed either way. 
in order to assess based on the income basis, you need to, as the owner of the property, reveal the income that you receive from the rentals. Um, the Southshire Housing Group, or formerly RAC, they use the income basis to do their uh, appraisals. So they're not receiving a reduced appraisal, is my understanding. It's just that sometimes when you use the income, if your income is less, mm -hmm. your appraisal is reduced because that's where your income is. Now, is the income considered a um, like a secondary approach to try and reduce that that assessment, or is it the the starting point? So. I guess I need to have more information so that I can. Yeah, I, and, I, and, well. and we, 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 you know, at next at the next meeting, I think it, it, it's going to be helpful uh, for us to to provide uh, John Antononi, who's our chief assessor. He can talk a little bit about the two approaches mm -hmm. to uh, appraising properties. Uh, from our perspective, I can't tell you one's better than the other. I can't tell you one's going to work out for the owner better than the other. But we'll we'll have that information next time when we talk. Okay, and then the other question that came up that I had absolutely no information on, and maybe this was brought forth to some other people as well, um, there's questions as to whether or not the property that is going to be used was actually meant for townhouses, and I, I had absolutely no idea what was going on. Um, Originally the plan was right. he was going to build those duplex units, just like the ones that are on South Street now, it was going to carry right through to Silver Street. Okay, so I guess the, the information that I was asked was, the person thought it was um, a Jack Appleman project. It was. Correct. It was. And so now that's off the table, and now this is coming He's in. He's selling the land to, to Rack. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and there and are several contingencies. The, the contingencies are one, that funding is available, and he can get all the funding he needs. Uh, so he won't buy the property unless the funding is available. Two, I'm sure there's a permit contingency as well, because the Development Review Board is going to have to take a, a second look at this to make sure that uh, all the access issues and the, the density issues are addressed appropriately. And I, I look out to Dan to see if he's nodding yes. And I, um, So there, there's opportunity for people who are living in the project and around the project to, to be heard. Okay, yeah, because there was some concerns. Uh, I guess originally they thought they were buying into a townhouse that would be surrounded by townhouses, and now all of a sudden it's changed on them. And um, <coughs> it's now going to be surrounded by, you know, low-income housing. Um, it's not low-income. It's affordable. Well, it's, it's well, call it what, what you will. And um, and so now they're concerned about their property values, as they should be. And and so I just want to make sure I give them the, the right well, the, Yeah, there'll be the normal permitting process for what you build where mm -hmm. going on. Which, Can I ask, which well, Stuart, how much time has town staff worked to help facilitate this grant? Uh, I'm going to say very little. Uh, Mike and I, uh, as the two... Um, signers or designees. Uh, the application was entirely put together by uh, the regional group. Uh, we have to sign it once the board approves the application. Uh, my name goes on as the signer on behalf of the board. It, it basically is a log into the website, follow through the process and say yes, submit. Uh, and Mike is the follow-up and, and he'll get any comments back from the Vermont Community Development block grant review folks. Uh, any questions that are, are generated, we'll be looking to the Shires folks to answer those questions and then we'll, we'll submit the answers on behalf of the town. So there's really very little time on our part. Uh, obviously we have to understand what the grant is and what he's saying, but other than that, we're not doing any work on their we, behalf. We, have, we haven't even seen any architect architectural renderings of any kind at this point, have we? No, and those will be prepared for the Development Review Board when the time yeah. is appropriate. Anything um, else, John? Yep. Um, second, I wanted to thank Michael for developing the list of our top 25 employers. I think that's a good first step in, t in trying to at least uh, reach out and, and push ourselves forward. Um, wanted to let people know that we will be developing um, points of contact at each of these companies. We'll make sure that we have our foot in the ground and, and ear to the door. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for putting that together and making that, that happen. Um, Next thing that I was looking at was uh, two meetings ago, I had asked about the Plasson uh, project that was presented four or five years ago and looking for more information on that. And uh, it slipped my mind last meeting. I know it was supposed to be brought up again, but I thought I'd ask now. Um, frankly, Are you talking about the construction project that never happened? 
They were looking to expand and yeah, something. Yeah, we got that. Oh, we, uh, yeah. Maybe uh, it might have been a meeting weren't here. That was it was about the footprint versus. Basically, it came yeah. down to a, a cost. Thank you for reminding me, Greg. Yeah. It came down to a, a cost uh, issue for them. They they in fact put up a temporary structure in lieu of building uh, an expansion at the facility simply due to cost. There were no permit issues that could not have been uh, overcome. They had to go through the same process to put up the temporary structure that they did would have a permanent structure. Okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't the permitting issues that created the problem. It was simply a cost to build. Okay. What was our involvement during that process? Just. Uh, we work w with them at, at the local level uh, for the permit v review and the development review board review process. Okay. All Good. Set. All righty. Thank you, John. I do have a couple of things here. Um, there has been some conversation that I've had um, board members asking me about a uh, review process for the town manager from the select board, which we do not have in, pr in place at the time. Um, ergo, we have no record of Stuart's illustrious career. Um, and, you know, at, at the risk of, you know, sounding like an attack, it's really not. I mean, I, I think everybody's, everybody has a review process in their company. And, um, you know, just for an example, we went through the largest uh, natural disaster in Vermont history a few years ago. And really the only record we have of how the town management handled that is the debt that we have left from it. And uh, it's not a very fair assessment of how the town management reacted and was prepared for such a thing. Um, so what I've done is I've put together a packet for the board to take and study so we can put it on a future agenda. It's a combination of uh, things, of review processes from around the state, including information from our, our process and, and input on how to put a process together. So uh, in response to some of those conversations, uh, everybody's going to get a little homework. And then uh, when we feel ready to talk about it, we can put it on the agenda and, and see how we want to proceed on that. John? Yeah, um, I just want to note that this is more, again, it's not about, you know, attacking anybody. It's more about setting certain goals, understanding where we're moving, and um, having some accountability on everyone's end. It's just making sure that we set something forward at the beginning of the year and try and hit those right. marks. Exactly. And, and I think, you know, I review my staff twice a year. Just people should know where they stand and what expectations and set goals and things like that. So. We get it quarterly. Tom? I think it's more, more, not so much, and I think we find ourselves not having this process because we have had no policy. Correct. And I think that's going to be the first thing that we n need to develop is the policy before we jump into evaluation of any sort. Uh, because, you know, this uh, material it might be helpful, but absent a policy of how we go and what we want, I think it's just a, an effort. I think that's all part yeah. of the discussion. How, how how are we going to do it and what are we going to do and yeah. when that type of thing. So that's a future <coughs> agenda item um, when everybody's comfortable with I guess getting through. The one other point, I mean, we're, we're here in April. Um, our year is July, July. So I, I would like to try and get the first review out of the way this year if possible. So if, if we have to have extra meetings, I'm open for well, it. Well, I think that's one um, of the conversations we need to have is does the policy go around the fiscal year? Does it go around the select board year? Does it go, you know, where do we put it? Right. And, and when, when are we going to have that conversation? Right. Um, if we can fit it on the next agenda, we can have that on the next, on the next meeting. So I'd like to do it soon. Um, I don't think it's going to take you a lot of time to get through this stuff. It looks a lot worse than it is. <laughs> um, couple other things. Um, just for people to know, our scheduled meetings are the second and the fourth Monday of every month right here in the third floor of the firehouse at 6 o'clock p.m. unless otherwise noted. So uh, we invite the public to come to these meetings. These are your meetings. And um, we have an email address. It is selectboard at benningtonvt.org. If you send an email to that address, everyone on the board and town staff gets it. It becomes public record. So we invite people to be part of the process. Um, I, we have an executive session scheduled, so I'm going to ask for a motion to go into executive session to discuss contracts and personnel issues. So moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? All, all in favor? <laughs> that is unanimous. Um, I'm going to ask the public to clear the room. and Anyone who's not part of the executive session, we'll have a few minutes until that happens. And uh, thank you all very much.